Hey guys, have you ever noticed how Christians have these little catchphrases that they use when they do certain things? For example, when a Christian is praying, they say their whole prayer, whatever they're saying, and then at the very end, what do they do? They always say the same thing. In Jesus' name, amen. Or, when someone's baptizing a new believer, they always say the same thing. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or, when a Christian makes plans to go and do something, a lot of times they feel this pressure that they need to say, God willing or Lord willing, to leave it open that maybe God could change their plans. Why do we do these things? Well, a lot of Christians feel like they have to do these things because there are certain Bible verses that say to do these things. For example, saying in Jesus' name, amen, at the end of your prayer. Why do we do it? Well, because Jesus says to pray in his name. But I want to point out that that's not what the Bible means when it says these things. There is not a single verse in the entire Bible that says that you need to say the correct phrase. When we say, in Jesus' name, amen, at the end of our prayer, we're treating it almost as if it's some sort of magical abracadabra phrase that we say in order to get God to answer our prayers. That's not what Jesus meant. When Jesus said to pray in his name, he didn't mean at the end of your prayer, you need to say, in Jesus' name. He didn't mean that we have to say anything. And this actually comes back to a larger point in that we see the phrase, the name of Jesus, all throughout the New Testament, and we don't understand what it means because we read it with our own cultural mindset, and we don't ever bother figuring out the cultural mindset of the people who were writing it. You see, the ancient Jewish mindset was that the name of a person represented the person. The name represented the person. When the Bible refers to the name of Jesus, it's not referring to the word Jesus. It's referring to the person Jesus. The ancient Jewish mindset was that the name of a person represents the person. So saying the name of Jesus was equivalent to saying the person of Jesus. For example, in Isaiah 30, 27 to 28, it says, Look, the name of Yahweh comes from afar, burning with his anger and heaviness of cloud. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue is like a devouring fire, and his breath is like an overflowing river. It reaches up to the neck. In this verse, it says, The name of Yahweh is coming, burning with his anger and heaviness of cloud. His lips are full of indignation. His tongue is like a devouring fire. The name of Yahweh is Yahweh. Saying the name of Yahweh is a way of referring to Yahweh himself. In Psalm 20, verse 1, it says, May Yahweh answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of Jacob's God protect you. The name of Jacob's God is a way of referring to God himself, not just saying the name is going to protect you. In Deuteronomy 12, 11, Moses said, And then at the place that Yahweh your God will choose to let his name dwell there, there you shall bring all the things I am commanding you. The name represents the person. The name is dwelling there. In John 17, 26, Jesus said in his prayer, And I made known to them your name, and will make it known, in order that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I may be in them. When Jesus said this, he wasn't saying that he told the disciples the name of God. No, the name of God was already in Scripture. It was in the Old Testament. They could go and look at it themselves. Jesus was saying that he made God known to them. He showed them who God is. In Jewish culture, saying the name of Yahweh was the same thing as saying Yahweh. And trusting in the name of Yahweh was a way of saying trusting in Yahweh. And the same is true. When Jesus said that we need to pray in his name, 
He wasn't saying that we need to say in the name of Jesus when we finish our prayers. He was saying that we need to pray in Him. We need to be in Him when we pray. If we want our prayers to be answered, we need to be found in Jesus. This means so much more than just saying the right phrase. Imagine if you were praying, and at the end of your prayer, instead of saying, in the name of Jesus, you said, abracadabra, amen. Be like, what are you doing? Like, you're just using this phrase as if it's some sort of magical phrase to get what you want from God? That's not how this works. But that's how Christians treat the phrase, in the name of Jesus. We treat it like it's this magical phrase we need to say. It's not a magical phrase. There's not a single magical phrase that we ever need to say in Christianity. We read these Bible verses and we don't bother learning the original cultural context. And so then we think we understand it, but we've never even put in the effort to understand it. When you pray, you are either in the name of Jesus because you are living in him, your whole life is in him, or you're not in him. Whether or not you say in the name of Jesus is irrelevant. In fact, I encourage you, get out of the habit of saying in the name of Jesus, amen. Stop doing that. That is just a religious thing that really demonstrates a lack of understanding of prayer. Start trying to figure out what the Bible says instead of just duplicating what the culture around you does. We need to understand what it means to be in Jesus, to be in the name of Jesus at all times. That's how we're supposed to be living our entire life. And we get into this in a lot of detail in our book, Dead Church, which is also available. The exact same thing is also available as a video series on our YouTube channel. You can find the link down in the description below. We need to understand what it means to live in Jesus, not just say in the name of Jesus when we pray. This is the same thing when Paul said in Romans that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, as we saw in Dead Church, the modern understanding of that verse is not what Paul meant because Jesus said that you can call him Lord and live a life that so clearly shows that you believe he was raised from the dead and yet he will say, I never knew you. Using the word Jesus and confessing with your mouth that he is Lord does not get you saved. We need to understand what Paul meant when he said these things. Shortly after that, he quoted the Old Testament when he said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He's not saying everyone who literally says these certain words will be saved. He's saying everyone who calls on Jesus, who goes to him and becomes one with him, they will be saved. We need to understand the cultural context and we need to understand the biblical context. So similarly, Jesus said that we should go forward baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what do we do? We baptize people and we literally say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's not what Jesus meant. In fact, when you read Acts, you don't see one example of someone saying that when they baptize someone else. It never happens. It's not recorded at least. It's because it's not about saying a magic phrase. It's not abracadabra. It's not, you need to say these words. That's religion. That is not what Jesus came to establish. He did not come to establish a religion where you need to make sure you say the right words. No, when you baptize someone, you need to understand what does it mean that I am now immersing, that's what the word baptism means, I am immersing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, remember, the name of someone represents the person itself. The phrase, the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the Holy Spirit, represents the person of the Father, the person of the Son, the person of the Holy Spirit. You are immersing them in who God is. You are immersing them into Jesus. Which is why Paul says in Romans 6, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
You were not baptized into the word Jesus. You were baptized into the person Jesus. That's what it means to be baptized in the name of the Son. You're baptized into Jesus. And again, that word baptized means immersed. You are immersed into Jesus. So that's two examples of ways that we take these phrases from the Bible and we use them as if they're these magical phrases that do something just by saying the words. There's nothing in the Bible that is about just saying the right words. And I want to look at James because James is an example of something that I actually don't know many Christians who do it. But a lot of Christians teach that when you make plans, you need to say God willing or Lord willing, because James says, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. So you shouldn't say, I'm going to do this. And then you don't end up being able to do it because God does something or you die or something. So you just need to be able to say, I'm going to do this God willing. And it's become this religious phrase that some Christians feel like they have to say because the Bible says you have to say it. And they're, in fact, actually missing the entire point of what James is saying, because he's not telling you to say a certain phrase. He's, in fact, telling you to do a completely different thing. And I want to look at that. So that particular verse is James 4, and I'll start in verse 13. Come now, you who say... Today or tomorrow, we will go to some city. We will stay there a year, do business, and make money. But you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Your life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time, but then it vanishes. Instead, you should say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you are arrogant and you brag. All of this bragging is wrong. Therefore, Anyone who knows the right thing to do, but does not do it, for him it is sin. Christians so often take this verse and say, when you make plans, you need to say, if the Lord wills. Otherwise, you're being arrogant and you're saying you're going to do something that maybe God is going to change your plans and your yes won't be yes. But that's missing the entire point. And you should be able to see that it's missing the entire point from what I just read. James concluded that little section by saying, Therefore, anyone who knows the right thing to do but does not do it, for him it is sin. Therefore means, this is connected to what I just said. This is my conclusion from what I just said. Well, hold on. How is that connected to what he just said? James is saying, you should say, if the Lord wills, then I will go and I will do this, or I will go and I will do that. Therefore, if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, it's sin. Those seem like two completely separate thoughts, but he's connecting it with a therefore. Well, this brings me to a bigger point, and that's when we read the Bible, most Christians are reading the Bible completely wrong. Because we open it up to James 4, 13 to 17, and we think we can understand it from that, and you cannot. If you want to guarantee that you don't understand the Bible, keep reading it that way. When you read the Bible, and you open it up, and you read a paragraph or even a chapter, you're pretty much guaranteeing that you're not going to understand what it's saying, because you're completely taking it out of context. This was never meant for you to just pick a few sentences out, a few verses. There were not even chapter numbers or verses in the original text that James wrote. Christians think that James is telling them to use some magical abracadabra phrase whenever they make a plan because they don't understand this verse. And they don't understand this verse because they read it by itself. They treat James and pretty much every other book of the Bible as if the author had ADD and was skipping around from topic to topic to topic without making any sense. They treat it like this passage has no connection to what comes in the rest of the book of James. But it's directly connected to what James is talking about in the rest of the book. The entire book is staying on topic. But most Christians don't see that because they don't read it as a whole. They treat James like it's okay for them to open it up, read maybe a chapter, and then close their Bible and go on with their day, and the next day they'll read the next chapter. Well, that guarantees that they don't see the full picture, because the book of James was one letter that was intended to be read 
all at the same time, and it is one continuous thought throughout. He doesn't have ADD. He's not skipping around from topic to topic to topic. Think of it this way, and I'm going to show you this in just a second, but the book of James is basically saying, don't love money, don't love the world. 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 Say God willing when you make plans. Don't love money, don't love the world. Don't love money, don't love the world. We read these passages, so many of them we separate, so many of them we miss the point because we separate and we don't even see what his point is. But if you read through it, he's consistently coming back to the same topic. Don't love money and don't love the world. Specifically, when you're relating with other people, when you're relating with the poor, don't evaluate people based on their wealth or their status. But his point is consistently, don't love money and don't love the world. In fact, that's his point right before this passage. The book of James consistently is talking about not loving money and not loving the world and not going through life thinking about the things of the world. But most Christians don't see that because they don't read James as a book. They read James chapter 4 verses 13 to 17. And so they miss the whole point because they don't see the context and the context, I used to be taught that the context of a verse was 12 verses before and 12 verses after. That is a total lie. The context of these verses is the entire book of James, and really, it's the entire rest of the Bible. You need to understand what the apostles were teaching as a whole, what Jesus was teaching as a whole. And that'll help you understand. You'll see these verses and you'll say, oh, okay, I get it. Because you understand what they were teaching. Do you think that maybe, just maybe, those four little verses that say, say God willing when you make plans, are perhaps related to the rest of what James has been talking about both before and after those verses? Do you really think that James is ADD and just changing topics like that? Just suddenly just over here and then he's over here and then he's over here like squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. No, James is staying on topic. Those verses that are telling you to say God willing, which it's not actually saying that, but those verses are telling you the same thing James has been saying all throughout his letter. Do not love money and do not love the world. So let's go through James very briefly. All the way back in James 1, he began talking about brothers and sisters who are poor and brothers and sisters who are rich and how those who are rich and pursuing the things of this world are going to die in their pursuits, which is kind of exactly what he was saying in James 4 when he says, you know, you're making plans to go to the city and make money. Don't you know that your life is a vapor? It's the same thing. Then shortly thereafter in James 1, he starts talking about you need to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. You can't just hear God's word. You need to do what it says. And we know from other places that God's word talks extensively about money and wealth and riches and comfort and pleasure and loving the world. That is a huge part of what Jesus taught. And we get into that in Dead Church, which again is available as a book as well as a video series, and it's all free. So James says, do what God says. Don't just be a hearer. If you're just a hearer, you're deceiving yourself. He then says at the end of chapter one that you need to keep yourself free from the world's evil influence. And then he dives into it. In chapter two, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, never show partiality. Suppose someone comes into your assembly wearing nice clothes and a gold ring. At the same time, a poor person comes in wearing old, dirty clothes. You look favorably on the one wearing nice clothes and say, please sit here in this good seat. But you say to the poor person, stand over there or sit on the floor by my feet. What are you doing? You're making some people more important than others and you are judging with evil thoughts. Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, did not God choose the poor in the world to be rich with faith and to be heirs of the kingdom God promised to those who love him? But you show no respect to the poor. 
So James is giving them this hypothetical situation where he's showing them, you guys are discriminating between the poor and the rich. You still care about money. You still care about the world. You still care about wealth. You still care about status in this world. That's not what's important. You're thinking wrong. You're showing partiality. You're not treating everybody as equals. The poor are the ones who are going to inherit the kingdom of God, not the rich. He then goes on from there saying, if you show partiality, you are sinning. You are guilty of breaking God's law. Then he continues later in that chapter, in the section that many of us are familiar with, we talked about it in Dead Church, where he says, if you say you have faith, but you don't have works, your faith is dead. A man is justified by his works, not by faith alone. That whole passage is connected to what he just said. If you are discriminating between the poor and the rich, you are showing that you still care about the things of this world. You're still looking at wealth and status. And instead of looking at the world the way God sees it, you are showing partiality. You're discriminating between the poor and the rich. By discriminating, you don't have works. You, have, you say you have faith, but you don't have works because you are doing the wrong thing. You are discriminating between the poor and the rich. You still care about the things of this world. You don't have works, and therefore you don't have true faith, and therefore you are not saved. And then he continues. In chapter 3, he starts talking about how your words are hurting other people. It's still connected. Okay, This whole thing is really talking about how you're treating other people. Are you treating them wrong because they're poor? Are you treating them well because they're rich? Are you hurting them with your words? And then in chapter 3, verse 13, he says, Are there those among you who are truly wise and understanding? Then they should show it by living right and doing good things with a gentleness that comes from wisdom. This wisdom is always ready to help those who are troubled and to do good for others. It is impartial and honest. So again, he's still coming back to that partiality that they're showing. He's saying true wisdom cares about helping people. It's impartial. It doesn't discriminate. True wisdom is ready to help. It's ready to do good. It's thinking about others and not yourself. And then right after this, in chapter 4, he says, Do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that war within you. You want things, but you do not have them, so you're ready to kill and are jealous of other people, but you still cannot get what you want. So you argue and fight. You do not get what you want because you do not ask God, or when you ask, you do not receive because the reason you ask is wrong. You want things so you can use them for your own pleasures. Again, it's coming back to this loving the world, loving money, loving riches, wanting things for yourself versus true wisdom, which is ready to help others, which is thinking about others. He says, you adulterers, don't you know that loving the world is the same as hating God? Anyone who wants to be a friend of the world becomes God's enemy. So now, for a few chapters, he's been talking about how they are discriminating based on the things of this world. They're looking at the rich person, the wealthy person, the person with high status, and they're saying, that person is the one we should favor, and the poor person, they're less important. They're valuing the things of this world. True wisdom is ready to help the poor person. True wisdom is ready to do good to others and is not looking out for yourself. As opposed to chapter 4, where he starts talking about, you guys want things for your own pleasures. This is where your fights, this is where your arguments are coming from. You want things for yourself. You're thinking about this world and the pleasures of this world. And that makes you an adulterer. That means you hate God and you're his enemy. Because if you love the world, you are God's enemy still. And he continues, So give yourselves completely to God. Resist the devil and the devil will flee from you. Come near to God and God will come near to you. You sinners, purify your hands. You who are trying to follow God and the world at the same time, purify your hearts. He hasn't changed topics. If you love the world, you hate 
God. If you are distinguishing between the rich and the poor, you show that you still love the world. You don't have works, therefore you don't have faith, therefore you're not saved, therefore you are an adulterer, you love the world, you hate God, and you're his enemy. If you're trying to follow God and the world at the same time, make your thinking pure, because you are defiled. And then just after this, he gets to the verse we've been talking about. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to some city, we will stay there a year, do business, and make money. But you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Your life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time, but then it vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. But now you are arrogant and you brag. All of this bragging is wrong. Therefore, anyone who knows the right thing to do but does not do it, for him it is sin. Okay, so up until this point, he's been saying, don't love the world, don't love money. Don't love the world, don't love money. Don't love the world, don't love money. Say God willing when you make plans. Has he changed topics? Well, let's keep reading. Next verse. You rich people, come now. Weep and be very sad because of the miseries that are coming to you. Okay, hold on. He's going back to loving the world and loving money. He's going back to talking about the rich and loving the things of this world. So maybe he hasn't changed his topic. He continues on. Your riches have rotted and your clothes have been eaten by moths. Your gold and silver have corroded and that corrosion will be a proof that you were wrong. It will eat your flesh like fire. You stored up your treasure in the last days. Your life on earth was full of luxury and pleasure. You made yourselves fat like an animal ready to be killed. So we can see James is going through this letter saying, you guys are loving money, you're loving the world, you're distracted, you're thinking about the wrong thing, you're loving money, you're loving the world, you need to stop, you need to change your way of thinking, you need to purify your hearts, you need to get the right perspective. Stop loving money, stop loving the world, say God willing, stop loving money, stop loving the world, get your right perspective. We need to stop thinking that the authors of scripture had ADD and were changing their topics all the time. Okay? We need to start reading the letters as a whole and getting the full picture of what is their point. What are they trying to say? So let's look at these verses. Come now you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to some city, we will stay there a year, do business, and make money. Okay, pause. He's addressing these people who are building their lives around doing business and making money. That seems connected to everything else he's been saying. Hmm, okay, let's keep going. But you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Your life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time, but then it vanishes. Okay, pause. This goes back to what James said in chapter one. In chapter one, he said, the rich will die like a flower in the field. The sun rises with scorching heat and dries up the grass. The flower falls off and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will die while they are still taking care of business. So James hasn't changed his topic. He's still talking about the rich, those who love money, those who are prioritizing the things of this world. Then he continues. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Pause. Okay, two verses ago, he said, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to some city, we will stay there a year, do business, and make money. In that verse, we understand that he's, he's talking about people who are making certain plans. And this is the plan that they're making. They're going to go do business and make money. However, two verses later, he says, Instead, you should say, and we treat it, as if he's saying, this is a rule, you need to speak these words. No. He's saying, instead, you should make this plan. If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. 
Now, the reason this is confusing to so many people is because we read the phrase, if the Lord wills, and we don't really understand what it means because we don't use words like that in normal everyday English. It's Christianese, if the Lord wills. Okay, the word wills means wants. He's saying, if the Lord wants, okay? Instead, you should say, if the Lord wants, we will live and do this or that. Here's what James is saying. He's saying, instead of making your plans, saying, we're going to go and we're going to do business and we're going to make money, you should be saying, we're going to do what God wants. We're going to do what God wants. We're going to live. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do the things that the Lord wants. That is how we're going to make our plans. Instead of saying, we're going to go and make money, we're going to say, if God wants, we'll do this. If God wants, we'll do that. If this is what God wants, then this is what we will do. He's not saying, speak these words. Use this magical phrase that makes what you're doing okay. No, he's saying, stop building your life around the world and money and pleasure and luxury and wealth. Stop making your plans around making money. That is not what's important. Instead of building your life around how you're going to make money, you should build your life around doing what God wants you to do. That's why he concludes this paragraph by saying, therefore, anyone who knows the right thing to do, but does not do it, for him it is sin. If you know what God wants you to do and you're not doing that, it's sin. If you know what God wants you to do, but instead you're too busy building your life around business and making money, then it's sin. You should be making your plans around what God wants you to do, not around doing business and making money. That is what James is saying, which is why he can then continue on immediately talking about the rich who love money and love this world and how they're going to die and their wealth will be used against them to show that they were living the wrong way. He hasn't changed his topic. He's still talking about the same thing he's been talking about since chapter one. Many of us are familiar with the phrase from James, the double-minded man. Okay, the double-minded man is a man who is thinking two different things at the same time. He's thinking about the world, but he also thinks he loves God. He's trying to love God and love the world at the same time. You can't do that. You need to pick a side because if you love the world, you hate God. If you love money, you hate God. If you love pleasure, you hate God. Pick a side. Are you going to love God or are you going to love the world? Stop making your plans around your business, your career, how to make money, how to get the things in this life that you want. Stop building your life around that. Because if you're not doing what God wants, if you're not doing the right thing, it's sin. And if you're living a rich, luxurious life of pleasure and you have tons of wealth and you are not building the kingdom and you're not using that wealth by giving it to the poor like Jesus commanded you to do, then that wealth will be used against you. It will prove that you were wrong. So here's my point. Whether we're talking about saying in Jesus' name or saying baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or saying God willing, or many other things that Christians think they have to say the right words, there is nothing in all of Scripture that is about you having to just say the right words. That's never the point. And you need to read the Bible in order to understand the point. It's not religion. It's not about saying the right words. It's not about some abracadabra, now your prayer is going to be answered. It's about doing what God wants and obeying his word. Doing what it says, not just hearing what it says. Furthermore, 
If you want to understand the Bible, you need to stop reading just a few little verses at a time. You need to stop reading just a chapter at a time. The book of James is one letter that was meant for you to read through the entire thing in one sitting, as was every other letter in the Bible. Every other one of the epistles was meant for you to read in one sitting. I would argue that pretty much every book in the Bible was meant for you to read in one sitting. This requires you giving it time, which means maybe you need to stop building your life around the business and the money you're going to make. And you need to start giving yourself time to do what God wants, which does not mean just reading the Bible. It means doing what it says, being a doer, not just a hearer. But if you want to understand the Bible, you have to stop looking up individual verses and thinking that you understand it. If you want to guarantee that you will never understand the Bible, keep looking up individual verses and thinking you can understand it by just one individual verse or a few verses around it. The context is always an entire book of the Bible and really the entire Bible itself. The context is understanding the message that was taught throughout Scripture. That's how you will understand these verses. Stop going to Bible Gateway and looking up the verses that make you feel good. Stop opening up to Jeremiah 29 being like, oh, God knows the plans he has for me. You need to understand what this says. None of these verses are just feel-good verses, and none of these verses are a single verse that stands alone that you can read that one verse, and then you just know everything. You need to understand the full message, otherwise you'll read a verse like the one in James 4 and you're going to think that you have this phrase that you need to say when you make plans and then if you don't say it, you'll feel guilty. Now, honestly, a lot of Christians don't actually do that, but that is what's taught. What's taught is you need to say this phrase when you say you're going to do something because otherwise you're being arrogant. And that's completely missing the whole point. And as a result, so many Christians are disobeying what the point actually is because they make plans to go do business and make money and they say God willing when they make that plan. And they think they're obeying it and they've missed the whole point. The point is never to say a certain phrase. The point is never that you need to use these particular words in order to be right with God. The point is that you need to do what Scripture as a whole teaches. And in order to do what it teaches as a whole, you need to know it as a whole.